Frequency sampling is one common method that can be used to design finite impulse response filters. Recall that a finite impulse response filter has a difference equation that takes the form the output at time n is given by a weighted combination of past values of the input. The bk's are the weighting coefficients. And then the system function is also a function of the bk's. It's just the sum from k equals 0 to m, bk is e to the minus k which of course implies that the frequency response is given by the sum k equals 0 to m bk e to the minus j k omega. Now, it's useful to note that the frequency response here is a polynomial function of e to the minus j omega. And the fact that it's a polynomial means that this kind of frequency response is going to have to be smooth. And that has an impact on the kind of frequency responses that can be realistically designed with FAR filters. And of course, the larger the order of the polynomial, as m increases, we can get more complex shapes. Of course, the impulse response of a finite impulse response filter is just equal to the coefficients of the difference equation. So for 0 to m values of n, we have the impulse response is b sub n, and then it's zero otherwise, of course, because the impulse response is indeed finite in duration. So the frequency sampling design approach chooses the coefficients bk so that the frequency response approximates some desired response, a sub l e to the j phi of l, at capital N frequencies. So we take, pick frequencies where we want to specify our response of our finite impulse response filter, and we set the response at those frequencies equal to some desired amplitude and phase. To see how this is done, it's most convenient to write the frequency response, h of e to the j omega, as an inner product of two vectors. And this is a sum of products of the bk's times e to the minus j k omega. So if I factor the b's into one vector, I've got b0, b1, b2 through bm, and then I'll factor out the e to the minus j k omega into a different vector. So I have 1 times b0 plus e to the minus j omega times b1 plus e to the minus j2 omega times b2, and so on, finally ending with e to the minus j m omega times b sub m. And if I define this vector that depends on frequency omega as d of omega, and I define the vector of coefficients as b, and I'm using the underscore to denote that these symbols refer to vectors, then I can write my frequency response just as the inner product between the vector d of omega and the vector b. Now most of the time we're interested in filters with real valued coefficients or real valued impulse responses. And for that to take place, the frequency response has to be conjugate symmetric. If the frequency response doesn't have conjugate symmetry, then the coefficients, the b's, will have imaginary components in general. So if we want to require that at frequency omega L, we have response A sub L, E to the J phi sub L, then at frequency minus omega sub L, we're going to require response A sub L, E to the minus J phi sub L, because this is the complex conjugate of the response at the positive frequency. And this leads us to a system of equations where I have two equations, and m plus 1 unknowns in the vector b. So I want d, omega sub l, inner product with b sub l, to be equal to a sub l, e to the j, phi sub l. And then I'm going to have d of minus omega l times b be equal to a sub l, e to the minus j, phi sub l. So at each frequency, we're going to have a pair of equations. And this gives us two equations for each L. There's a total of m plus 1 unknowns in B. We can combine these into a system of linear equations by assuming that there's a total of capital N divided by two frequencies at which we want to specify the response. So I've got frequencies omega 1, omega 2, through omega sub n over 2. And there's the, then the negative frequencies as well, which have to be specified. So at frequency omega 1, I want 
the frequency response, the left-hand side, to be equal to a1 e to the j phi 1, frequency omega 2, a2 e to the j phi 2, at frequency omega sub n over 2, we want the response to be a sub n over 2 e to the j phi sub n over 2. And then we have the conjugate of those response at the negative frequencies. So when I look at this system of linear equations, I have a total of n equations, and there's a total of m plus 1 unknowns, and I can take this matrix here and call that capital D matrix. It's going to be n by m plus 1. B, of course, is m plus 1 by 1, and F is an n by 1 vector. Now it turns out you can show that this matrix will be full rank as long as the frequencies, the omega sub L's, are distinct. And it wouldn't make sense to use the same frequency twice. So since this matrix, D, is full rank, we know that if n, the number of constraints, is less than or equal to m plus 1, the number of elements in B, then we can exactly satisfy the system of linear equations. That is, we can find an FIR filter that will have the specified response at those frequencies exactly. It's a really nice property to have, although there are some limitations in terms of what we can do with this. We have exact control of the frequency response of our filter at up to m plus 1 divided by 2 frequencies. So the higher the order of the filter, the bigger m is, the more frequencies at which we can control the response exactly. However, in between the frequencies that we specify, we have no control of the response. And this can sometimes cause problems. Now, we spoke a minute ago about the frequency response being a polynomial in e to the minus j omega. And so what we're trying to do is fit our frequency response to a set of points. It's like fitting those points with a polynomial. And so the behavior in between the frequency points that we specify is going to be like that of a polynomial. Depending on how those constraints are specified, we can get different types of behavior in between. The best results, recognizing that polynomials are generally smooth, is to specify gradual changes in the desired response of our filter. If that changes slowly from frequency to frequency, then it's more likely that the polynomial will do a good job of fitting in between the points as well. Here's an example to illustrate this design strategy. We've chosen frequencies that are spaced by pi over 51 radians, and we're going to choose 50 of those. And I'm going to use m equals 100, so we have 101 degrees of freedom. We're going to have 50 frequencies, so that leads to a total of 100 constraints. So we should be able to design a filter that meets an arbitrary response at these frequencies. For illustration purposes, I've chosen the gain of the filter to take the form of 1 plus a cosine of 4 times the frequency divided by 2. So this gain is going to oscillate between 1 and 0. And then for phase, we're going to use negative 50 omega sub L times a factor 1 plus 0.2 sine omega sub L. In these graphs, the red circles denote the desired magnitude response and phase response, while the blue lines denote the magnitude and phase response of the filter that we designed using this frequency sampling approach. And you can see that as we expected, the response of the filter goes exactly through every frequency sample that we specified, and in between it behaves quite nicely, and that's in part because we chose a fairly smooth response for the magnitude response, and we also chose a phase response that was very consistent with the type of responses that you get with a length 100 filter. In particular, the dominant effect here in the phase response is a slope of negative 50 for the phase, and if I had a FIR filter of length 101 samples, then the midpoint is about 50 samples, and so on average there's about 50 samples delay introduced by that filter, 
So a linear phase component of minus 50 is very consistent with this kind of a FR filter. You can see that the impulse response has an interesting shape, maybe not one that you might guess, but nevertheless this produces these desired responses. Now I can choose a phase response that's not well suited for the FR filter, and then I get some strange behavior with my frequency sampling design. So in this example here, we're using the identical set of frequencies, the identical magnitude response, it's just we've changed the phase response so that it has a very shallow slope. It is negative omega sub L times 1 plus a sine term, and you can see the nature of that phase response by the red circles shown in this graph here on the right. As predicted, we still have 100 constraints and 101 degrees of freedom, so we can satisfy these constraints exactly, and we see that the frequency response, the actual filter as shown by the blue line, goes through every one of those constraints that we specified. However, it behaves rather erratically in between points, and that's because we're asking this filter to do something that is quite difficult to do for a length 101 FIR filter. The way it satisfies the constraints is with a polynomial shape that has significant excursions outside of the design frequencies. And yet it still goes through every one, and here you can see the impulse response. So for the frequency sampling approach to work well, we need to choose our desired response to be consistent with the type of responses that are well approximated with FIR filters. Now what happens if we choose the number of constraints to exceed the number of degrees of freedom that we have in the FR filter? Well, we, one can do this, and then we end up with a system of equations that we solve to get the FR filter coefficients, where we have capital N equations in m plus 1 unknowns. And if n is greater than m, then it's no longer possible to satisfy this system equations exactly in general, but we can try to find the coefficients that minimize the squared error between our filter response and the desired response. If you do this, you end up with a least squares solution that takes this form here where I have D complex conjugate transpose, that's what the superscript H means, times D quantity inverse times D complex conjugate transpose F, and that will give us our FR filter coefficients. Now in this case, we're not obtaining the exact solution at any particular frequency. We're going to obtain an approximate solution at, in general, all of the frequencies, and the solution that minimizes the squared error. Now it turns out, as you increase n, and you let n be very big, if those samples, frequency samples, are saved from a range of frequencies specified by capital gamma, then this least squares problem becomes equivalent to minimizing the integral of the squared error over that frequency band between the filter that we're wishing to design, h of e to the j omega, and our desired frequency response on that interval. One of the nice things about the frequency sampling design approach is that we can control the response of the filter at arbitrary frequencies, and we can set up any response that we want and easily solve for a filter that achieves that. The challenge is that there's no control of the response in between the frequencies that we specify. And if we specify a desired response that is not well suited to an FR filter, we can get unusual behavior in between the frequencies, which leads to a not a very useful design.